Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining Espresso Tutorials today for our first ever virtual book club meeting. My name is Alice Adams and I'll be moderating today. Today we're discussing the Practical Guide to SAP GTS Parts 1 and 2 with our authors Rajan Eer and Kevin Riddle. Um, before I ask our authors to introduce themselves, I'd like to go through just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, we encourage you to post questions as they come up so that we have a good pipeline of questions going. And once we go through um, a few initial questions with the authors, we'll start on your questions. So we'll have plenty of time to go through those. If you have any technical difficulties, feel free to send um, myself a chat message and I'll do my best to help you. So with that, let's ask our authors to briefly introduce our, themselves. I'm Kevin Rajan. Who would like to go first? So Kevin, do you want to Roger, do that? Do you want to go ahead? Uh, oh, sure, okay. I will. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is Kevin Riddell. Uh, I'm with Tremco Incorporated. I've been with Tremco for 22 years. My role currently is International Logistics Manager. And how I fit into SAP GTS is I'm the business process owner for GTS at Tremco. I'm responsible for customs and trade compliance, and GTS is our chosen tool to manage that. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, um, I am uh, one of the co-founder and the CTO of a leading global trade and supply chain solutions company. Uh, name is called Crip. Um, I'm personally also a licensed custom broker and have led several trade and logistics automation for global companies. Um, authored uh, several bestseller books uh, and white paper. Um, at Crip, my typical day is filled with customer interactions working with passionate team, very talented, uh, and partners like the solution provider, you know, uh, we work with a lot of our software partners like SAP, content providers, um, and our, you know, my role is to basically come up with these solutions and innovations working with customers. And our ultimate objective is to delight them. Great, thank you both so much. So before we ask um, some questions, we thought we'd start today off with a poll. and kind of gauge where our audience is when it comes to GTS. So I'm going to launch the poll, and you should see it on your screen. Um, so we're curious about what version of GTS you're running. Is it earlier than 10, um, version 10, version 11, or possibly not using um, GTS at all? So um, while we're waiting for those results to come in, we did have one question that I'd like to address. Um, someone asked if this session will be recorded and provided um, later on our blog. And we, w we are recording a session, and we anticipate having that posted on the blog next week, so definitely keep an eye out for that. Okay, we have most of our results in. Um, just I'll give people another second or so here before I close the poll. Okay, so we had um, a very even split here. We have 33% earlier than 10, 33% um, on version 10, and 33% are not using um, GTS. Um, Rajan or Kevin, would you like to comment on those results? Are those similar to what you see um, in the market? Yeah. So this is Rajan, let me say, and then maybe Kevin can uh, share his, his experience of where they are in. Um, yeah, that's uh, typically what we are seeing is, um, you know, GTS stock um, was introduced in early 2003, and um, as you can see, the version 11 is the latest, uh, which has been in market almost like six, uh, yeah, seven months. Um, there has been quite a considerable, you know, the upgrade or functionality which has been released from eight. So there are a lot of companies who are still in the range of eight and 10, um, so I'm not surprised. Um, but there's also quite a new functionality being released in 11. So that gives a kind of a poll, kind of, you know, I can see that, how the split has been. Great, yes. thank you. We started on, sorry, we started on version 10, so I haven't actually used all the versions, but I know there are people that have not felt the need to move past the version they're on. I guess they felt the differences weren't great enough. I believe version 11 could change that. The, the version 11 changes are significant, and will likely entice people to want to move on to it. And I hope that we will have some time later in the call um, to dive into those changes in version 11 in a little bit more detail. 
Um, so first question for both of you. Kevin, I'm going to ask you first. So why a book on GTS? Uh, to be honest, I implemented GTS and began using it and uh, was openly complaining that there was no practical guide for it, no uh, user manual, if you will. And it was Rajan who challenged me to, to write one. I think his words were, if you want one, why don't you write it yourself? And that's exactly what ended up happening with his assistance, of course. Uh, my contributions to the book are from a user perspective, and Rajan is uh, more technical. Right. Yeah, so one of the reasons I, and I know uh, this is the discussion we, you know, Kevin has been, um, he's a great in terms of, you know, he's been our customer, but also he has been a great in terms of being critics, um, um, you know, in terms of giving a valuable feedback. Um, one thing we did see, um, there has been, you know, this functionality when it got released, it, it, it was definitely built, uh, it's a, one of the robust and best practice, uh, you know, best, you know, you know, in the in the market right now, in terms of the uh, extensive um, reach and globe and industry, but um, there was a lack of in terms of you know the the usability of it uh, to say. And um, there were books available which talked about or you know um, addressed the implementation of the system part of it, but there wasn't anything which could uh, speak to the you know the business uh, value. And how to use it um, after you go live? How best you can, you know, um, get value out of your investment. So that definitely was part of that. And when Kevin, you know, did bring it up, and um, we said, you know, this is an opportunity for us to collaborate as well. Um, and then, you know, that's that's the, you know, uh, I would say start of the genesis of it. And we started to really brainstorm, and we reached out to. It's several publishing company and Expresso was really keen in getting this to my, you know, uh, published. Well, thank you, and thank you for choosing Espresso. <laughs> um, so, Kevin, I want to circle back to something you said. You, you know, mentioned that your perspective and contributions from the book largely come from the customer perspective. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about why your company decided to work with GTS and you know, maybe some of the features that you like about the tool? Sure, no problem. Uh, we did look at other options, definitely. This was back in 2010, 2011 at the selection stage. Why we ended up with GTS, uh, several reasons. It, it's the most complete set of solutions all in one package, whereas most of the other options require you to uh, use this option for preference, for example, and go to a different tool for SPL screening, whereas GTS offers a wide suite from customs management to SPL to preference all in one tool. Uh, it's out of the box, easy to integrate to SAP, and we are an SAP shop. Uh, it just made sense that way. SAP is familiar to our users, the, the screen visualization, the, the way the screens work, uh, is something that our users would be used to. And it also just guaranteed me the support of my internal SAP IT team. Whereas if I went with an outside solution, uh, I would have to rely on that company's IT support to keep things going. Okay, great, thank you. So in preparation for today's um, webinar, I asked each of you to think a little bit more about um, a DTS tip that you could share. I think something that um, readers will especially like about this book is how practical and hands-on it is. So, um, Rajan, could you share a, a tip from an IT implementation perspective for us? So, yeah, sure. Um, I, I have several, but I, I think I'll, I'll pick a few which, um, which I guess are more from a, uh, it can be strategic as well and a little bit uh, tactical. Um, one other thing we found um, is a trade solution implementation. Um, people look at it, you know, you know uh, it starts with more of IT, but, and then, you know, we reach out to the business. Um, I would look at this more from a, a business process automation. Um, what I mean by that is, I like, like to look at your processes, what you're doing today, and you know you need to look at from the basic fundamental of do you have you know the basic data available in terms of your how you're managing 
your trade process, your classification, your key integration with your logistics and supply chain, and make those impact assessment before you start into this whole journey. Uh, that's very key. And you know, if you have done that, you know, your your software implementation or GTS trade implementation becomes more um, smoother and easier. The second point I would give uh, um, it's also again a little bit of a strategic. Um, you know, you like to you know see everybody wants to achieve you know the ultimate goal. Um, you know, we know all that A20 rule. Um, what we really need to look at is what's the you know the basic core um, that drives the standard processes, the best known methods, because this software does provide you with some of these you know which are practiced by different industries. Um, you can actually enable a lot of your processes using that and go live or other start getting familiar with it, um, see what how much it fits your business process, and then um, you know go towards attacking those exceptions you have in the company. Um, and at least at the last I would say it's not it's most important as well is um, we need to give a, a very thorough thought on you know before we go live. Uh, we you know we hear a lot of horror stories on you know we have done enough testing but when we turned on GTS we had a lot of issues or any trade solution because it's um, but GTS is more um, and I can you know um, Kevin can speak to it is it integrates very well so there are customers who are a little bit scared you know suddenly I see a lot of you know my documents are blocked um, you can actually mitigate that very well if you've done your planning thought through your you know list of issues which might come up as part of your go live and then plan it um, so these are some tips I would give um, and I do have you know you ha you can talk about some of the specifics on some functionality you're going to enable uh, but I want to give it at a, at a high level and you know we do talk about this in this book in terms of how you can um, mitigate some of the risk you know and the tool selection but this these are something you know we we tend to ignore that you know Thank you. Kevin, do you have a tip you'd like from the user perspective? Uh, yes. First, I just want to back up what Rajan said, that I, I agree it, it needs to be a business process. Uh, don't. If anybody is looking to implement SAP GPS, I would recommend you view this as a compliance project, not as an IT project. Uh, make sure that the primary goal is for your company to be compliant and that SAP GPS is the tool to get you there. I don't allow it to simply be a software installation and accept the, or expect that the software will take care of everything. Uh, like any tool, it's only as good as what's fed into it and how it's used. And on that topic, my, my main tip would be to focus on your master data ahead of time. Uh, make sure that all the necessary master data that GTS requires to do its analysis, to do the function that that, that, that data is clean uh, because GTS won't give you valuable results if it doesn't have valuable data going into it. Great, good advice, thank you. So we'd like to go ahead and open up um, questions to listeners. So I encourage you to um, type your questions in. It looks like we already have a few in the queue. So um, if you haven't typed your question yet, um, this is the time to do that. So we've already referenced um, the newest version of DTS 11.0, um, and we have a couple of questions on that. Could you tell us a little bit more about um, some of the new features that are included um, in the new version? So, uh, let this Rajan and me, and then um, so the the um, you know with 11 uh, definitely the one of the uh, the key is uh, been. Um, at least you know you can see uh, the messaging from SAP side is the FTZ, which is the foreign trade zone. Um, in addition to that, there is also quite a push uh, from SAP on the whole user experience, which is um, you know in in the past, I think one of the complaints has been that this tool is very difficult to use, um, and you know it's good, it's a lot of you know functionality in there, but it's not easy to use it. So the user experience kind of takes that, uh, makes it you know more user friendly. You are 
you know, if I can give a little simple answer, is I know it's it, it's basically customized for for your day-to-day -day work, and you're not overwhelmed by uh, looking at a screen which is has too much information. Also, you're not navigating through multiple transactions. Um, so that's those are the two ones: uh, foreign trade zone and um, and uh, user experience. I would say um, because there are quite a delta functionality release from each area, which is on a big list. But those are the major ones. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I would just mm -hmm. like to add to that as well the proposed changes to SPL screening and configuration. All right. Sanction part of this configuration currently is a very complex part of SAP GTS. Uh, that's, that's a good thing in that we have many options. We can customize our screening to our company's needs. But I do realize that many people have found it overwhelming and wished for a, a simpler setup related to SPL, and that is one of the deliverables of version 11 is uh, if you are on the HANA platform, the sanctioned part of the screening has some much simpler setup tools. So on that same topic, on the sanctioned party list, what are the, some of the misconceptions around those lists? Uh, I, I'll take that first if you don't mind. Uh, the first misconception that I run into in the industry is that sanctioned party list screening is an export thing. Uh, I'll hear people say, well, we don't export, so I'm not really concerned about that. Uh, sanctioned party list screening is much bigger than simply an export uh, issue. It can apply to your imports, who you're purchasing from, and it can apply to a company down the street in the same state. Uh, there's no reason why somebody domestically can't be flagged on any of these sanctioned party lists. So I encourage everybody to sanction part of the screen against all their business partners, domestic and foreign. And that's definitely uh, something I hear out there in the industry. It's misperceived as an export issue. Right. So this is Rajan. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think um, I think Kevin did mention about it that. Um, there are, within SPL, um, you know, SPL also has evolved quite a bit with GTS. Um, it started off with um, the core SPL, which was part of their, um, their what they call SAP's build-on, which is a, a BAP engine. So they had, they are quite a, quite a, um, um, options you can based on what's your. Uh, it's 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 never SPL is never a one size fit all depending on customer depending on what kind of uh, compliance requirement you have, you can actually make use of those different, uh, what we call configurable items available on the core. And then they had come up with the T-Rex, which is, um, uses a, like a search algorithm. Um, you know, it's similar to, I think, um, like a better example, it could be like a Google search type. And then you have also HANA, which is more uh, sophisticated in terms of the search. So there are, there are different, um, this has really um, has gone through several iterations, and they have done a, quite a bit uh, work on SPL. Um, and from a from a usability of you know how you want which best fits you, we have tried to address it in this book as well. And uh, for a company, uh, it'd be good for them to explore that. And the one good thing is, even though it sounds very overwhelming, um, but if you have you know if you have understood this, and we have tried to explain it very simply in this book as well. Um, it's not rocket scientist. It's not rocket science. You know, you can understand it. And once you've done it, you know, I've seen companies doesn't have to revisit it, or maybe they had to revisit because they have um, acquired a new company and you know they are getting into new geography. You can. Otherwise, you know, it, it, it's very robust. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So our next question is: Could you share some examples of a situation where configuration? could impact compliance? Well, I, I think probably sticking with sanction part of the screening is, is a great example of that. Uh, the configuration settings you make in GTS decide whether or not a close match will hit. So imagine that there is a Department of Treasury forbidden party called Kevin Rydell, R-Y-D-E-L, and my name is Kevin Riddell, R-I-D-D-E-L-L. Do you believe that that's close enough that GTS should flag that as a potential match and force a user to make a decision? And, and your configuration settings will decide 
what I like to call how wide your net is. You can have as wide a net as you want, and, and it will increase the amount of potential hits you have to review, or you can make it narrow um, and reduce that. And it's all about a balance of workload and compliance risk. How much compliance risk are you willing to tolerate within the workload that your users are able to manage? And the good thing about SAP BTS is it gives you that power to make those settings. Whereas if you were to use a off-the-shelf uh, on-demand sanctioned part of the screening tool as is out there, you might not have that level of customization and you'll be forced to use whatever settings the vendor has currently set it at. Yeah, I, I think Kevin, is, that's a great one. Um, I, I, I would say there are a few comes to my mind other than that is uh, within license management. Uh, there, are, um, there are a few things people tend to ignore is basically um, on, on, on the, especially the licenses like your individual validator license or licenses which need um, specific uh, review or control. Um, typically, I have seen customers do use that quite a manual process. Um, there are configurations available where you can restrict to the level where you can narrow down to the specifics of, let's say, it has to have a specific, um, let's say, your end user example or even a specific for IVL. Um, you can automate it to the greatest extent because there's so much configuration available and you need to understand the whole license management very well. So that's a configuration element where it can help reduce your workload quite a bit. Um, the other thing I would also suggest is, which is a little bit of general on, on the, um, the whole cell file and the broker, uh, people do tend to use a broker in a more of a semi-automated. Um, with, the, with the current you know, SAP GTS is also certified for API, you can actually configure your system to get to the data where you want. Um, where you are not electronically enabled to file it, but you still enable, you know, use, make use of brokers. So basically you have everything coming out from SAP system as if it's electronic filing, uh, but you make use of the broker where they have the value. So those are something which you can decide as part of your configuration, um, but you know, it makes a lot of uh, impact because now you have power within you, you use broker where they add value and you have the ability to negotiate with them. So there are two things I can think of. One is you know, how much you want to automate it, uh, get to know the system, which allows you to automate, and you know you have to intervene where you wanted to really look at it um, as an exception. The other one is where you, you know, you're, you're, you're foolproof in terms of the data you're submitting to your broker. Uh, and then you also have an uh, upper hand in, your, in terms of you know, when you're working with your broker, you can negotiate the rates with them. Okay, great, thank you. So one of the topics that comes up um, more so in the second book, if I recall correctly, tell me if I'm wrong, um, free trade agreements. Can you talk a little bit more about how some companies um, use those free trade agreements to improve their ROI? Um, yes, if you don't mind, I'll start on that. Uh, free trade agreements are unfortunately uh, abused in the industry uh, and misunderstood. Uh, I'm sure many people have had the experience where they're speaking with somebody in their business and they make a complaint about why is there duty on that? Don't we have free trade? Uh, they, they assume that free trade just means duty is, is no longer a, a factor. The truth is all your products have to qualify for the free trade agreement in question before you are supposed to take advantage of them. And if you are taking advantage of free trade, say you're claiming NAFTA on a U.S. to Canada good, and your product doesn't qualify, or even you just don't know that it qualifies, you are subject to potential penalties. Uh, those penalties are real, and the customs administrations are, are getting more uh, aggressive on, on prosecuting these and, and investigating these. So the ROI in many cases is really penalty avoidance because the company is already claiming free trade. And by implementing a tool like GTS and protecting yourself, you guarantee that you will always be able to claim free trade and that you won't run into any problems. Now, if a company 
is not claiming free trade because they don't have a tool, that's great. And in those cases, this could open the door to true uh, savings. You will now be avoiding duty that you previously paid. In Kremko's case, we avoid uh, $4 million in duty annually through free trade. And by using GTS to guarantee that our products are eligible, we can uh, make that $4 million savings comfortably and without uh, any fear of penalty. Yes, yeah, so if I can add to what Karen, Kevin is definitely is very, um, you know, he's very knowledgeable. Uh, what I would uh, add to that is the way I see free trade is it's, um, is, it's, um, it's, it needs to be managed like a program. Um, I, I see this as going to like uh, four stages. Um, you need to basically create what you call like awareness program where you need to be get a good comfortable on the rules of origin. You know, uh, if you're sourcing for multiple vendors and um, and anything related to product specific rules from a tariff. So that's basically fundamental. You start with that foundation of being aware. Um, and then the second stage is the visibility. That's knowing that you can review your bill of material um, for any uh, product and look at um, the details within the purchase order, uh, determine the you know the qual the, the qualities uh, you know the, the quantities under the your original trade agreement, um, and you should be able to also provide you know uh, get the required documentation from your supplier and or even help your supplier right. That's the whole you know. So this needs to be looked at it. The system part is definitely there, but you need to look at it as a whole as a program that. You have awareness that you know what you have in your company, visibility uh, within your product and your suppliers. And the third portion is the documentation, which is very required. You know, if you have, um, you should have templates ready where you can make leverage that, um, not from an inbound when you're getting the vendor declaration, but also from an outbound, you're leveraging this. And the, the last and the most important as well is um, the procedures and operations, which is very, very critical. Um, we had customers who had, you know, by you know saying that they are live or, or they at least have implemented, you know, the FTA, but they were not using it. And we actually called in where, you know, we saw that you know, the, the functionality was there in the system, but no one knew what to do about it because this is a this is one of those one of those uh, implementation, you know, at Global Trade is a very business process related, but this is more free trade is quite a intensive in terms of you know working with your business process and it just it it, it goes across uh, your core team of global trade it goes your procurement and also your sales side sales uh, department so uh, procedures and operations are very key uh, for making sure that you you can get an ROI out of this um, you know free trade uh, functional implementation and if I can just add one more thing, I, mean, I think it's accepted that this is something many companies struggle with, how to calculate the ROI related to a free trade tool. Uh, and this is something we deliberately put into book two uh, to help with this. So our book two, which covers preference, includes discovery questions and an ROI calculator template uh, based on Tremco and Crypt's experience in the past to help people get their arms around this. Great, thank you. So we do have time for a couple more questions. I just want to encourage our listeners to submit any remaining questions that they have. Um, our next question is, um, what are some of the pros and cons of automated broker filing versus self-file for custom declarations? Yeah, I, I, this, let me answer this. Uh, yeah, Kevin, I think the, this is, um, I did answer in the previous, kind of a little bit uh, mentioned about uh, so one of the, um, you know, I see the advantage of, I guess, companies to use both. Um, we have customers who are using self-file, which depending on, um, you know, how they are structured or, or what kind of teams they have, um, I can give a customer who are in San Diego where they did choose to go with self-file because they were well equipped in terms of their, um, they, they had, 
not just because of SAP GTS was certified, so they decided to go with that. They already had a, a model within the company where they were involved in these filing very closely, uh, even though they were using brokers. Um, so when they had chosen this, so they had a team structure, they had infrastructure to do that. Um, the key difference is where when you use broker, you might have broker, you rely on broker in terms of providing the um, you know, uh, information that it's been filed and you get back on any corrections. Um, when you do self-file, you get instantaneous and you know that um, you have done the filing correction correctly. Um, when you use ABI, uh, you can be same level confident. The only thing is, uh, in this case, um, as long as you are doing the ABI interface, you have the data ready and you're pretty sure about it. If there are changes for the broker things, then know there are some corrections, um, you know, they can notify you later. So I think it's just a matter of um, do you have the infrastructure, do you have a team to manage it for the self file? Um, if not, then, you know, you make use of the broker. Um, but if you use broker, I guess there is a little bit of dependency with the broker on that. Um, in both model, you know, customers do use broker uh, depending on because broker do add value um, in terms of you know because they they are on the ground they know um, you know this business very well. Um, so the advantage of the self file is you probably are paying them for you know the services which they bring value in terms of you know it may not be just the filing part of it but maybe clearance or something some goods are struck. The other case where you have using the broker for ABI, you might be paying for every file you're doing. So there's a little bit of a cost implication of what you're using, and also depends on, as a company, um, what kind of infrastructure you have, and you know, so um, what works better for you. Because it both, you know, you have to you know do the ROI on that. Because if you have your own team, you're paying for them. Um, does it you know um, justify? you know, having external resource, which is depending on where, where you have, you know, saving money, yeah. And if I can just build on that from a customs compliance perspective, the importer of record is always responsible for the accuracy of the declaration. And when you introduce a, a third party, a customs broker, you don't lose that liability. So it adds to your business an extra burden of having to audit the work the customs broker does on your behalf. By self-filing, you have the, the ability to simplify the whole process so that your data goes direct to customs and you don't have to scrutinize what that third party did with your data as a middle step. Yeah, one thing I will add onto that is one, just wanna, uh, we had one customer actually uh, were using broker. They, they continue to use broker. They were paying around $450 per uh, transaction but they uh, enabled it as part of the GTS ABI, and they were able to negotiate to you know close to like thirty-five or forty-five dollar per transaction. They're still using broker, as Kevin was saying. You know, it doesn't matter if you're using broker; you are still responsible. So they want to be comfortable that the data they are sending it to the broker is right. But in 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 turn, they also got the benefit of negotiating with the broker of um, you know lesser money they were paying them. So. <laughs> Great, thank you. So I believe this is our last question. Um, what can you tell us about the deadline for the base or ACE single window for customs all moving? Yeah, I think people who are in this, you know, they know this is a one of thing which was which has been mandated. It's the date has been pushed out. Um, what customs is looking at is um, like a single uh, point where both export and import. Um, can be accepted from that point of view. I think uh, we have uh, some of our customers started the journey. In fact, uh, we have a customer uh, which I was talking about uh, in San Diego. They got they they went live two weeks back. So that's one thing is a trend we're seeing um, as as people are. So it's 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 part of the you know uh, customs. They're trying to unify that. Um, and uh, SAP GTS is capable of you know uh, doing that. Great, thank you. So before we wrap up, um, do either of you have any 
closing information about um, GTS that you'd like to share. Um, and I'd also ask you um, to share any upcoming events that you'll be speaking at. So this is um, sure, Roger. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. So um, yeah, I um, the only thing I would add is I think um, in um, don't want to sound that I'm promoting this book, but I think we are we have given a thought is you know through this book is to um, you know look at it from a point of view where um, this is you know in the not just to configure it well, but look at it from a point of view what's the you know the the benefit this tool can provide, or even when you before you're deciding on, is this the right tool for me, um, so that it can, um, and also it can speak to the the business users. That's our uh, main goal. Um, in the past, actually, I have also authored a book on GTS, which has been a bestseller. But that was more driven towards people where we saw there was a lack of awareness in the global trade. But this is very focused towards the user. That's what Kevin. He has brought in his experience of going through this whole, you know, implementation. His, you know, so whatever pain he had, he's trying to actually convert that into a, you know, lesson learned or knowledge for the other people, so they don't have to go through that. Um, that's the only thing I would like to conclude. In terms of other upcoming um, conferences, uh, we do participate quite a bit, um, and I think the one we just came uh, this week we had was supply chain, which is already done, uh, over. But we have the few, the ones which are upcoming is um, this that is a big one, which is in May. You know, uh, Kevin will be speaking as well, and we have a few of our customers speaking. Uh, and then we have a uh, few local chapter we do. Um, again, I don't know exactly the period. The, you know, the SAP ASA, they have some um, uh, local events happens. Uh, we do participate and we sponsor there. Uh, we have sessions. Um, one of them we had was on the user experience and the FTZ we're trying to promote that because that's a new functionality and we have webinars and blogs so if you could you know if you keep a uh, if you wanted to be part of that we can keep you informed on these um, you know webinars and event which we have some uh, you know constantly going on or if you are attending the uh, Sapphire someone we can also share with you those customer sessions as well yeah. Great, thank you. Kevin, uh, any uh, final thoughts? Yes, I, I guess just in closing, my final comment on the book, uh, to agree with what Rajan said, is my primary goal was to offer a tool to help people use GTS compliantly. Uh, I view GTS as, as just a tool. Having GTS does not make you compliant. It's what you do with it that makes it compliant. Uh, so I encourage people to, to look into how they're using GTS and, and audit it for potential gaps because the actual implementation itself doesn't really accomplish anything. It's what your users are doing with it. And as far as future events, uh, yes, I'll be speaking at ASUG Sapphire. Uh, there's both a lecture presentation with Tremco's story as well as down on the influence booth down on the floor, there'll be a deep dive into the preference portion of SAP GTS. I encourage anybody interested in preference to, to show up for that. And I am also the chair of the User Influence Council for ASUG for GTS. And I encourage anybody using GTS currently to, to get involved in something like that. SAP really does give us a good venue to uh, speak back to them, to push desired enhancements, uh, to, to really influence the product. And I would just encourage anybody who's using GTS to get out there, to get involved, and to let their voice be heard. And if anybody wanted more information on that or to follow up, uh, they're more than welcome to reach out to me direct. Great. Well, I, I really want to thank Rajan and Kevin um, very much for taking your time today and sharing a little bit more about your books and so many useful um, SAP GTS tips. Um, and I'd also like to thank the listeners for calling in as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we will make a recording of the webinar available on this Bresso Tutorials blog next week. Um, we've also set up a special discount on the print version of part two of the practical guide for $5 off. Um, you can see the code on your screen, and we'll also send out an email with the code as well. So thank you all very much, and I hope you'll join us for our next virtual book club meeting next month on iDocs, and you can stay tuned on the blog for announcements about that. Thank you all very much. Thank you.